recording. Uh, a recording without sound to be kind of boring, so uh, now it should work. Wilczym Freigaben Nummer 3. Okay. Nice. Good. So we have everything. So um, in the last lecture we talked about pointers and structures and stuff like that and I think now it's time to um, start with the last uh, very basic aspect of any programming language which uh, will be functions so for that we will uh, start a new project we'll call it functions again just an empty console application and we will take a look into how <coughs> function uh, functions in general work on Windows. So, what uh, you already have seen is just the main function. So, <coughs> here um, every C++ program starts in a main function. The main function can have a couple arguments, um, either a list of of the command line arguments which has been passed to the a function which is uh, sorry to the program when it was started that would be the standardized simple uh, platform independent variant of the main function uh, when compiling for Windows you can also have a win main function which uh, instead which contains a couple additional parameters uh, so that is good to know but usually um, if you want to create code which will run on any platform you just should use the normal main function and that's it um, and of course the first thing we should do now is to write some own first own function so let's um, so the way you define a function is you first write a return value a type in this case use, we can use int if you don't want the function to return any values you would use a void instead and then you don't need to return a value from the function then we specify a name my function and then um, the body of the function, so then we have open close uh, normal brackets and then we open close curly brackets which will contain the body of the function and if we want we can specify some function arguments for example my argument 1 and my argument 2 and here you spe just specify uh, the type and then the argument name and you can have as many arguments as you want in principle there, there is no hard limit. Um, usually, of course, you would want to uh, limit it to some reasonable amount because then, if you write a function, you need to provide all these arguments, so that might be tedious. Uh, so, one uh, optimization might might be, for example, if you have a lot of values that you want to pass, that instead of uh, passing every value as a single argument, you would just create a structure uh, first, then you would. Um, enter some values into the structure and then just pass the whole structure as a argument that is that we will do as uh, next thing but first let's try out this function so uh, we need to give it some body so something to do so let's say we define an internal variable our result and let's just add the two uh, arguments to each other and let's be consistent and then give them also non-capitalized names so that's plus this and then we need to return the value we do it with the return keyword so return and then uh, we write the na name of a variable but in principle we could write an arbitrary equation so we could write this directly here or we could invoke another function so uh, it's it's quite flexible everything you can assign to a variable more or less you can also just uh, return from the function and if you would have a void function it would just return without anything but of since we have here a return type then we need to specify a return value okay and now to invoke the function first we will define some helper variables that will contain the arguments we could in principle um, pass the directly uh, arguments in the uh, call list of the function so we can either my function just write directly one comma two or we can use the vari variables um, instead obviously in a real life use case what we would do is we would um, 
use a, a variable only if we get the value for the variable from somewhere else or have a more complex equation that we want to um, resolve first and if we only pass a single value we just write the single value directly into the function call and of course we want the return value so in this case int my red as I mentioned I think earlier already um, when we were looking into ifs and uh, co control structures with regard to equations and operators uh, you can use functions inside any um, mathematical expression that you are uh, creating so it is quite a uh, flexible thing and here just um, you could also have like plus 3 if you... oops, where is the 3? Uh, numpad is not active and so on so it's it's quite flexible all at all but for the first try we will just uh, have one function call and now what we should do is we should take a look how this works on the hardware level so we run the program and here we now see the the function invocation so we see that we use the move operation to store the value of variable 1 and variable 2 in the hardware registers ECX and EDX uh, the prefix E in this case means that it's a 32-bit number if, if we would be using a 64-bit number it would be RDX and uh, RCX and of course if we look on the um, register list there are only the uh, full length of, uh, namings of them listed when we click through the list we will see the values here being assigned and then we use the call opcode to jump to the function um, I think that that will bring us first to a jump list as you see here we can disable this jam jump list and here again we have quite a lot of code in the function because I forgot to disable all these unneeded things uh, let's quickly do this so uh, code generation we don't want any runtime checks we don't want any security checks and um, we want here um, don't have this just my code support and last thing in the link uh, um, we don't want incremental linking so now if we rerun it uh, the code should be a bit simplified so again the invocation of the function looks just the same but now uh, if we have the cur cursor in the source code single step executes the whole line so we need always to click into the disassembly view if we want a real single step and then if we go to call we don't have the jump list anymore, we just directly jump to our function and what we do here is first we save uh, the value from the registers on the stack at predefined positions then we save one of the registers to the stack so we, we don't want to uh, we, we will want to restore it one before we return um, as I think I mentioned already uh, some of the registers are defined as volatile by the calling convention and some are defined as non-volatile this means that if you call a function uh, and return from the function the registers which are defined as volatile may have an arbitrary value the function can do whatever it wants with it, them and does not have to restore them to their original value while non-volatile registers are defined such that if you enter a function and if the function would want to change them it is responsible for first saving them then it can do with them whatever they want it wants but then before returning it has to restore the original value um, so this is uh, something to uh, keep in mind and to, uh, refer to the documentation which registers uh, are to be used in which way and of course this will depend also on the architecture you are on so uh, in this case here we are uh, we are using the 64-bit AMD architecture and if we would be using the 32-bit x86 architecture then uh, we would have less registers and different registers would be defined uh, differently so um, there is, is quite some uh, degree of uh, analogy so usually the uh, ECX and EDX registers will be also defined as um, volatile and of course if we would be uh, using some ARM platform which has um, 32 registers which uh, are named just x, uh, I think 0 until x31 uh, they uh, again some of them are defined as volatile and some are defined as non-volatile so uh, in this case the, the RBX register is defined as uh, volatile so it as non-volatile so it means it needs to be uh, saved 
and then we can um, start modifying it. So here <coughs> the, the body of the function is executed, we have already seen how this works when we looked on operators and finally so we let's quickly step through this and then uh, finally when we want to return what we are doing is we take the value from our variable myOS which is stored somewhere in memory and then write the value to the EAX or uh, rather REX register so if we do the step um, it should not be one uh, arc one arc two that should be three uh, oh <laughs> because I returned the wrong value here. That explains it, so let's <laughs> run it again. <coughs> let's again enter our function. Now, if we assign it, rex will be 3. Um, the register has been actually used here already for the operation, so it kind of kept the same value, but since this is a debug build, it doesn't do any optimization, so it kind of stores the value to memory and the next step it again gets the value from memory. Um, then what we do here is we, we restore the RSP and RBP uh, registers and finally we have this red instruction and what this return instruction does is it returns the control flow to the next instruction after the call opcode. And you might wonder how this actually works, so uh, how does the uh, CPU knows where to return to. Uh, that is actually quite simple. As soon as you call the call op, uh, as soon as you execute the call opcode, the position of the next instruction will be stored uh, to the uh, address where the stack pointer points to. Um, so on the stack, and then the pointer will be incremented. So once you enter the new function, um, you already have the return address stored on the stack and the return instruction just takes this value from the stack and executes a jump to this location. So we could um, rerun it again, we rerun re re our sample to see how this works. Oops, uh, again I forgot to click into this tab. So before we go to call we will grab the value from the stack pointer and we'll go in memory to that location and as soon as we execute, and we could maybe also here um, quickly dump the stack pointer, and then if we execute the call instruction, as you see here, a part of the stack has been overwritten, and then address has been written too. And then if we get the value, the stack pointer value again, we see that it has been incremented slightly. Oops, that was the wrong order was incremented as you see by 8 which is a pointer with its the pointer size on a 64 bit system and the value it was somewhere here uh, as you might have noticed i think it was this part as you might have noticed the way um this displays here work is that if from one step to the next step something changes that whatever change is marked in red but then if you execute another operation then the marking goes away so um yeah that's that and basically um if we take the value that this was pointing to so we can write a uh, point asterisk uh, asterisk or uh, it was rsp minus 8 i don't remember so plus 8 uh ah one moment we need double asterisks so we can um, get the different values in the stack and the thing is already smart enough to show us that uh, at the position of RSP, so where the pointer is pointing uh, to right now, um, we have an address and the, well a value and the value uh, is being recognized as belonging to function main line number 18, so here it is and um, so we know where the function would jump back to once uh, we resume execution. So if we put a breakpoint on red and run, we should go back to 0007FF and then something something 1094. So if we now here execute the step, as you see, we end up at this address. 
and then we execute the next um, operation in which case we just store the return value uh, back to our own um, local stack space where we uh, reserved some space for our uh, return variable. As you can see here in the main function um, the way the stack space is uh, allocated it is not like being allocated for every variable individually but the compiler just looks how much space will it needs and then it just allocates the required amount of space in one operation and then uh, you have when accessing uh, the different um, let's see what that, yeah. when accessing the different um, variables we just use the RBP uh, 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 um, register which contains a uh, copy of the RSP register plus a offset and then we just add here again another offset so the the very top of the base pointer is um, our first variable then plus 4 is the next var variable and if we have more variables it would continue uh, on and on um, if when compiling a release build usually the RBP register uh, will not be used so uh, then um, it can be just be used as a normal general purpose register which allows uh, to generate more optimal code, optimized code and instead uh, all the operations are just done with the stack pointer and offsets but since uh, this um, is less uh, suitable for um, debugging when compiling in debug mode we are using this um, base pointer RBP register for most of the operations instead and um, as mentioned the name is the base pointer of the current stack frame while the stack pointer is really the position in the stack so while the stack pointer would within a function might move around the base pointer should remain such that you can always use the same reference um, the same offset for the same variable if you would be using the stack pointer and you would uh, add some additional things to the stack then you would need to keep this in mind and then use a different offset to access the same variable so that get that adds a significant <laughs> additional confusion so using the base pointer in this way is um, convenient obviously for machine generated code one could say it doesn't matter but um, historically it was decided that that is a good approach also for, for debugging and it also helps uh, to uh, work the stack traces of um, a program if you are if the base pointer is used uh, properly instead of uh, changing the stack pointer every time so um, if we look here on the bottom we have this uh, call stack Ooh, let's uh, show more uh, show external code and then let's rerun the program so that we enter the breakpoint here this breakpoint and then you will see that in the call stack you see actually the names of all the functions uh, which have been called in the currently in the thread and which are being executed so we start in at some location in the NTDLL then we have some other location inside the kernel 32 DLL this is Windows internal stuff which is being initialized whenever a new thread is uh, created and uh, then we finally enter this uh, main CRT startup fu uh, function which is part of our application this function is created by the compiler it is part of the C runtime library and it is responsible for initializing various things before uh, we start the execution of our actual main function so you see here there are some more functions and we have another function called invoke main which as the name suggests will call our main function and then here finally we have our main function which then in turn calls our my function function um, actually if I recall correctly we should have this code uh, installed on the system as part of the uh, Visual Studio uh, Toolkit so we actually can see here how at least a part of the C runtime looks and what it does and well it it does many things so we won't spend too much time in, uh, looking into the into these details uh, since this is kind of aut automated and abstracted away from us so we don't need to care for it in the most scenarios there are certain edge cases where uh, that might be interesting but um, in normal cases it's not the important thing is that this uh, window here um, shows you the whole list of the functions so if you are in a function and are debugging something you always know where you came from and for this list to be properly constructed it is um, helpful if 
this uh, base pointer is used because, um, as already mentioned, the way uh, the stack keeps trace uh, keeps track of uh, where to return to, so basically of these addresses of these functions, is just by uh, putting the address of the functions to return to directly onto the stack together with all the other data. So if we don't have um, much reference, we would not automatically know without analyzing the code which positions, which offsets um, in the stack correspond to addresses and therefore uh, return addresses and which other values on the stack might be just random function pointers or just random data. There is a uh, st standard in which order the uh, register should be saved to the stack such that here when when kind of as is it's called walking the stack the debugger can easily uh, find all the functions uh, properly and can ignore all the other data on the stack so uh, as mentioned the base the, the, this usage of the base pointer register is, is quite useful and that's why it was um, kept even in machine generated code because it helps with because it helps the machine with in this case uh, tracing the stack. If you are using a program, do we have this installed? No, we don't. If you are using a program like, uh, for example, Task Explorer, I have it installed on the host. Um, when you select some application, then you can uh, list threads, and then you can, at least in theory, if it should show you the list of all the uh, threads. It's loading symbols. So loading symbols means. Um, to be able to show information about uh, the stack content, what you need is um, the ba this, uh, PDB files which are generated as part of the co compilation process. So, for example, here for the uh, functions we have those, so we have the names, but for kernel and for, for NTDLL we don't have the symbols, so it just sh shows the address without a name for the function, because the generated code obviously doesn't contain any function names, it only contains function addresses. We can actually uh, load the symbols from the Microsoft debug servers, and then, um, check, and then we will have the right names, and the symbols will be cached. So if we now will be w looking some stack trace for this module, so either the anti DLL or the kernel 42 DLL, it will automatically show us the right, um, uh, the right um, function name. Let's see if the other program already. Uh, has finish loading symbols something that will usually the program should work fine and show the symbols here. Um, so that's I don't know why it doesn't work now. Um, I think symbols. I will have to debug that. Um, or we can install the, a copy of the program quickly here on the machine and hope that this will. Um, that this will work fine on the other one. I think there is just some minor issue with the setup I have. Um, it's a quite nice open source file manager, uh, sorry, um, process manager. And usually it works reliably. Sometimes it only sometimes it does not. Let's restart it as admin quickly. Okay. Uh, and let's select our own application. Maybe. Oops. What was it? Functions exe threads. Select one. Yes. And here it works fine. So there is something with the other installation. And if we select the main thread, we more or less see the same thing we saw earlier. Just that. Um, it actually did not download the symbol, so it just shows uh, offsets uh, instead of addresses. So this is up to the convention of the application whether it would show always the full address or whether it would show the module name and or the function name. Actually, it shows function names plus offsets. This one here doesn't show the offset, so here it tells you kind of uh, like line information, but this data is not available here, so it just gives you the function name and then the offset within the function where the return would go to. And we actually also see that there are like two more threads in our function, uh, sorry, in our program, which have been created by the NTDLL while uh, the process was started to facilitate DLL loading, uh, parallelized DLL loading. And if the program would run for, for a few minutes, then those threads would terminate. Um, but 
since we just uh, trapped it here in the breakpoint almost instantly the those threads remained alive for um, well until we <laughs> resume the program so uh, this match to this um, window here as mentioned it's it's quite useful when debugging uh, so let's run it and um, yeah are there any questions at this point? So th this stack stuff is a bit um, important, so it's good if <laughs> if people understand that. All the other function related um, features of C and C++ that we will take a look at uh, kind of depend on the basic understanding how this fu very simple function call works. The, th the other ones are just more complex versions of the same thing. So are there any questions? Yes? Yes, they are recordings and they are linked in Moodle. Yes, yes. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. So, um, well, then let's uh, just quickly take a look how this function call would it's when it's boring <laughs> would look uh, when using the uh, a 32 bit uh, platform so we can switch to the old 32 bit Intel platform and then we can run the code again and as you see here uh, it looks kind of uh, quite quite different so um, we load uh, the values into register but then we are pushing the register on the stack so um Oh, I probably should uh, <laughs> explain what pushing and uh, so on means. So, uh, the push operation, what it does is it will take uh, the value of the register specified, copy that value to the memory at the address where the stack pointer points to, and then decrement the stack by um, how, however many bytes that it has written. So, in this case, um, it should always decrement by, by 4. So if you ca so it, you can kind of uh, write different things to the stack one after the other after the other just by invoking push multiple times and then providing different registers, and it automatically takes care of incrementing the stack pointer. Um, and the opposite operation to push is pop, which um, reads a uh, what is this? first it decrements the value of the pointer, then it reads uh, the value back, and then you can pop multiple things. So you you can uh, as we have seen this by in the 32 uh, 64-bit case um, in the function where about this uh, let's quickly jump to it again um, first we pushed the register onto the stack and then we popped it back so this is a method how you can easily save and restore registers just you enter a function and inside your function you just uh, push all the registers which are marked as uh, non-volatile which you want to use and then before you return you just pop them back uh, from the stack and the system automatically takes care of uh, adjusting the stack pointer so we can here if we run until there until here you can see that if we do this uh, step oh wait uh, we need to first go so if we do the step suck then the base pointer changed and the stack pointer changed well and the instruction pointer of course changed as well because it kind of is changing all the time as you are going further and further down okay so let's quickly switch back to the 32-bit version okay so here as you see instead of uh, uh, putting the values in registers and leaving them in registers the default behavior is to push all the things on the stack so one and two all the two registers then it calls the function so let's quickly take a look on that. Zack. Ah, I need to disable uh, those additional features for this uh, com for this build as well. So the settings you can select whether you want to change them only for a certain platform or for all platforms. And when I was changing those things before, uh, I just left it at the default where it just um, changes it for the current platform and not for everything. Okay, so now let's run it again. Okay, call. And here again, we are saving the base pointer register. You're moving the stack pointer to it. We are uh, allocating space on the stack. 
then we save a few uh, variables, so we are saving um, EBX, ESI and EDI then we do our operation uh, then we save the results of our operation and then once we want to return from the function we here uh, pop those registers back from the stack then we move the base pointer uh, to ESP so we, we kind of undo this operation and then we pop the original EBP value and then we do the last return uh, uh, opcode. So let's quickly go to the return, sac return, and then we are here. And after the call, we need to kind of remove those two things from the stack. But since we don't care for the val for their values, we just want the stack uh, pointer to be restored. We just increment the stack pointer by two times four. So each of those was four. So for every push, we need to make a uh, add ESP four. And here, obviously, to uh, make the code more efficient, the compiler just used eight instead. So, if you would have like ten, ten, v ten um, arguments, it would just uh, have a ESP um, eighty. Um, sorry, uh, ESP forty because the arguments are four bytes along. And then it uses the same register AX for the return value. And this um, is this differences in how a function call is really implemented is called a function calling convention because the only thing that is uh, really defined in hardware about how a function call is supposed to operate is that you should use the call instruction to jump to the function and that you should use the red uh, return um, opcode to return from the function and in principle you could even um, kind of manually implement a return opcode just by reading first the value from the stack, adjusting the stack and then executing a jump instruction. Uh, just that using a call and return is uh, much more convenient. Um, and But all the other things re re which uh, apply to how individual arguments are communicated to the function and how the return value from of, of a function is then being returned all those are part of a co of the calling convention uh, which um, the compiler designers are um, within reason free to choose however they want uh, realistically it is done such that um, you will have uh, for every platform some uh, defined calling conventions so for example for x86 um, you will have actually, uh, uh, f I think, four calling conventions which are uh, used um, in different scenarios, and th 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 they are so many is kind of uh, historic. Uh, while um, on x64, you have uh, basically just one calling convention for everything, and um, on ARM you also have just one calling convention. But then again, if you switch from Windows to Linux, on Linux the calling conventions looks look again differently. Um, what you will not usually see is that so basically the operating system designers choose a calling convention and normally normally the compiler designers of course they have to follow th those calling conventions to call operating system functions but they are free to implement additional calling conventions for internal use um, as they f see fit but then again if, if done so then your libraries would not be compatible with other uh, compilers so normally um, everyone tries to do the same thing uh, and just that simply um, for this 32-bit uh, uh, Intel version since um, there was a lot of legacy baggage and many people writing their own compilers in the very beginning uh, the, the whole thing just uh, became a bit more uh, convoluted and there are different uh, calling conventions that are being uh, used um, historically and on x86 uh, they just um, so and, uh, and on um, x64 um, Microsoft just said we, we only want to use one one calling convention and all the other people just um, <laughs> uh, ad adhered to this because there really is not that much of a reason nowadays to have many different calling conventions uh, there is an exception with regard to ARM uh, 64 uh, since Microsoft has implemented a um, com uh, interoperability mechanism to allow uh, emulated uh, IMD 64 applications to run on uh, the ARM architecture they have uh, 
changed in some of their binaries the typical ARM calling convention to resemble the uh, AMD64 calling convention such that this um, emulation and in, uh, interoperability steps can be made more efficient but this is only used when operating uh, with um, emulated uh, x64 applications on uh, ARM64 and just when running normal ARM applications on ARM then you just again have one standardized calling convention and in this case they even uh, adhere to the calling convention as is recommended by the uh, ARM platform, uh, ARM archi um, well, uh, by the ARM company, <laughs> let's say. Um, so they they did not make so many changes. And um, if you want, so here as mentioned, this works differently. And if you would want to uh, force a certain uh, calling convention to be used, which might be necessary. So, for example, if you have uh, a library which uses a specified calling convention. Um, you will need to somehow tell the compiler which uh, calling convention to use or you might want to create a library of your own and have a, a certain calling convention so what you can do is uh, you can before the um, between the type and the function name specify the actual con calling convention um, so uh, for example we could use std um, call and if we run this clack um, you see that uh, here we are um, pushing everything on the stack, so this is in this case the same calling convention that we already had. We could switch this to um, a fast call and fast call resembles the x64 calling convention, so you see here in using fast call we just keep the values in the ECX and EDX register and then we do the call um, the thing uh, become becomes a bit more uh, differentiated if we add more parameters. So uh, let's quickly do this. Let's create a function um, with ten arguments. So this function will just go back. Here we'll create my uh, function ten, which will have ten arguments. Because obviously, um, I, I said earlier, the amount of uh, r um, arguments that you can pass to a function is kind of not limited within reason. Of course, at some point you would, you would, <laughs> you cannot have like a millions of arguments because then you just don't have enough room in memory to store them. Uh, but generally, uh, it's not limited. But the register amount uh, that you have at your disposal on every single platform is um, very much limited. So you might wonder. How uh, oops. how this can be true if we are using registers to pass uh, values and then at the same time we say we can pass and we say we know that the amount of registers is limited but we say we can pass an arbitrary amount of values so how can this work and the simple answer is that um, it's only the first x arguments where x depends on the platform can be passed in the on the stack, while the rest of the arguments will always be passed. Um, sorry, only the really limited amount of arguments can be passed in the registers, and the rest of the arguments is passed on the stack. So if we switch to the 64-bit case, uh, uh, and now of course we should uh, invoke our new function, my function 10, and we will just um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, call all the in, uh, pass all the 10 values. We don't care for the return value. So as you see here, um, the way this works is the first four arguments are passed in this uh, registers. So ECX, EDX, as we have already seen, and then we have um, eight, uh, R8 and R9. And then the rest of our arguments are just put on the stack uh, directly. In this case, um, it doesn't use a pop instruction, it just uses a move and specifies a different uh, stack offset which is fine <coughs> and if we now switch back to 32-bit uh, and run we will see that here uh, it just uses push to push all the arguments on the on the stack and then it uses one add to clear the stack from all these values and if we now switch to the fast call calling convention then we will see that it will only use uh, the registers for the first two um, 
arguments and the remaining other arguments will be put on the stack so and also by the way you might notice here that we only have half as many registers as we had in the 64-bit case so this is one of the major improvements of the 64-bit platform that we have uh, much more registers at our disposal um, and now there are a couple more uh, calling conventions but um, for now uh, let's just leave it at that um, if, if you just to maybe write them down which other calling conventions are there so we had of course our std call which um, which is whatever is standard for the given platform then we had our fast call cdec that's a standard c call so the um, std call is something that is used uh, by windows a lot by the windows api fast call we already had um, and we have vector call um, could maybe uh, take a quick look at uh, how how C call is different so in this case um, it's again just puts everything on the on the stack <coughs> uh, there should be a difference to one of them. I think SCD call should have a difference namely that it will not have the the stack cleanup is different so right uh, the difference of std call to a c call so c call is the default for if you don't have anything i think earlier i, I mistook that for std call and std call is almost identical just that here after call you don't have a cleanup uh, invocation to remove the values from the stack so again just to compare stack. see here with the c call we have to uh, subtract the values or rather add the so, uh, right amount of bytes uh, back to the stack while with std call we don't have to do that and when we go into the std call into the function call um, to see how this looks internally uh, that didn't work out uh, let's run it again and just put a breakpoint here and then just and then just run it no okay uh -huh. ah was the wrong I wanted the breakpoint here right so as you see here the return instruction comes with a addition argument and the addition argument tells um, the return instruction to not only um, subtract um, one pointer size from the stack or rather add one pointer size to the stack but add um, in this case 28 um, which is the amount of memory needed for our 10 uh, arguments so and this is like it's not 28 decimal is 28 hex so if we quickly uh, type it in here uh, 20 uh, 0 x 28 that's um we need to disable hex uh what the, was the hex button um is it this if we disable hex then we'll get the actual decimal value so it's 40 as i mentioned it's just four times 10 arguments so that's what we subtract here and the advantage of this uh, calling convention is that wherever you are calling uh, a function using the std call you can save um, yourself uh, <laughs> one operation since the function itself will uh, restore the stack so the function kind of is bigger but the function call is smaller and usually since you are calling a function uh, multiple times uh, then you save on memory this way the downside of course here is that the function uh, must necessarily know how how many arguments it has and then um, if you would call a function mm, which has a different amount of arguments uh, then you would of course cause a stack corruption because then uh, the wrong value would have been subtracted from the stack obviously you should only call functions with the right amount <laughs> of arguments and if you would try to add additional arguments this would not work in the compiler so if you do this it will just uh, underscore it red because it knows you cannot use um, 11 arguments with that function but um, there are very easy ways how you can <laughs> call a function with the wrong amount of arguments so um, what we until did until, until now was we called functions by name which ba basically meant uh, the compiler just while compiling picked out the right address to jump to 
at compile time, but we can also use a thing called a function pointer. So we already have learned how um, normal uh, pointers to memory addresses work, where we store data in this memory. Uh, a, the concept of a function pointer is pretty much identical. It is a pointer, but instead of pointing to some data in memory, it just points to a function in the same uh, memory space. So the way you define the function pointer is a bit ugly. You start with the return type, then you open brackets, you add an asterisk, then you write its name my PTR, for example, so the name is arbitrary within the uh, already mentioned naming already mentioned naming restrictions of uh, C and then you close the brackets and then you provide the argument list and uh, you can finish it with a semi and you have to finish it with a semicolon and in principle the argument list does not need the names it just needs the types because uh, at this level um, it does not use you are not using the name so the names are used within the function if they are used and in the function itself you need to provide them but for the function pointer they are not important you can provide them and the reason is that if you then are calling a function pointer here as you see it just tells you int 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 and if you would uh, have left them then IntelliSense would uh, tell you uh, th their names and this is quite useful so um, it is a good practice to uh, to leave them uh, to leave the argument names uh, in place even though they are not necessary and then of course the next thing we need to do is we need to assign the function address so it's as simple as it c gets um, okay it doesn't want to because what did we change do we have the right amount of arguments the calling convention is wrong so we need to in this case the compiler even knows that the calling convention would uh, not work so we can either change here um, <coughs> to our the default calling convention or we have to explicitly uh, specify the calling convention before the asterisk in the brackets and then the assignment works and then of course to call the function it's uh, quite trivial we just call it the same way as we would call any other function so um, you don't need to have like an asterisk something like you might intuitively expect it to work uh, when knowing how normal pointers work here you really just specify the name and then you open the brackets and uh, this is simply because when you open the brackets the compiler already knows okay the user intends to call a function and the thing can either be a function pointer or a function directly there is no uh, distinction so like when you are assigning a value you might want to assign a value to the pointer or a value to the memory the pointer points to the same if you want to do any other operation with um, a pointer with in case you want to jump to a function call a function then uh, there is only one reasonable thing you can do if you have a, a, func a function pointer and hence it has uh, been this way that you don't need uh, to dereference it in any ways. The compiler automatically does this by default. And as we have learned uh, earlier with um, um, pointers and variables, we can cast variables from one type to another type. So what we can here do um, first, we could uh, create a variable of type void asterisk by void ptr, and we can assign anything to it that's a memory address. So we can just assign our function. And then instead of assigning our function here, we could want to do that. But again, void is like nothing, so the compiler doesn't know what that should be. So what we would need to do here is we, we would need to typecast this thing to the right type. Um, which we do like this, and in this case I will remove all the, all the names since uh, we don't need them and we don't use this cast in a way where we would need um, some sort of uh, we don't use the, the cast in a way where, where we would need some sort of hints of what these arguments are and now of course the opportunity to in introduce a bug is that if we would just have a c call function then since we are casting it, we are telling the compiler we know what we are doing, it probably is right, just do it <laughs> don't ask questions, just do it and it did it, so it is not complaining 
and now if we would run the code then uh, subsequently the program would crash although the program is now so short that it might actually finish <laughs> without crashing so if the code would be more complex what would happen now is that um, the C call function would um, not do so it would clean up its own right the C call function would not do anything it would just do its thing and return as is and the thing here in for the definition of the call would expect uh, that the function has um, cleaned up the stack so it would not do a stack cleanup and at this point you would have a lot of things on the stack and the stack pointer pointing not where it should be pointing and subsequent operations would not work um, so that much to this um, Okay, are there any questions at this uh, point? Wait, we need to have the right one, this one. Are the function pointers and the function cast fu function type casting clear? Okay. No one says anything, so let's assume yes. So um the next thing, uh, of course, which might be interesting, is that in C and C++ you can create functions without specifying the amount of arguments a function would even have. Although that only works with uh, selected calling conventions, so it would not work with std call. And um, um, hence, when using this, uh, those variable argument functions, they will always be uh, of type C call or fast call. And there is also uh, an interesting limitation to uh, fast call, on which we will take a look in a second. So let's write such a function. Int my function. And now let's um, add an argument which is not necessary but um, helpful. Int uh, n args. So n args will be just a number of arguments which we will then uh, specify. And if you have seen, uh, for example, the printf function which is used to write to the screen. It also is a variable argument function. It takes a format string and an arbitrary amount of arguments, and then within the string you have placeholders such that uh, the function knows which arguments to expect. And um, on the on the on the machine level, um, really, uh, what you can have any amount of fixed arguments, and then followed by an three points indicating that there might be more arguments of arbitrary type. And this, of course, um, adds a lot of opportunity to screw things up because the compiler is not able to check whether the arguments are right. Um, more advanced IDEs um, are made such that they for known functions will know which arguments to expect so if you have printf or some other uh, typical uh, string printing function uh, it w the ID would p will pass the format string and then hint you which arguments should be uh, which arguments types should be provided. Um, in our very simple case here, we will just write a function which will add together a couple of numbers. So we'll make a function which just uh, we need to give it a name. Uh, <laughs> um, so we'll make a function which will just uh, compute the um, let's say the average. So my func uh, my func average, and we need a few includes. So hash include. Um, what do we need? We need a uh, std arg, std std arg h, and I think and that should be actually all. Um, and this header has a few uh, special types. So variable argument list, um, argument pointer. So if we go to this, it is just defined as char asterisk. So just a very basic type that you can use to work through the memory. Um, and uh, then you need to initialize the list. So for R start argument pointer, and then you uh, give it the name of the first um, argument that of the sorry of the last argument that um, is not uh, variable. So if you have here more arguments, the last one is the one that you specify. Uh, and then. Uh, you can start using this list. So um, int max uh, 
we don't need the int max, we will only need um no oh, why not? Let's go with that. Um int uh we need an int average. Then we will have a loop. E is equal zero. E is less than argument count slash i plus plus. Okay, and now int uh, x is equals v a uh, arg argument pointer and int. So we need to specify the name which we picked when defining the list, and then um, we just add. Uh, we just tell the type which we expect. If we look how this is implemented, then we see internally that it just um, increments the VR list, or rather decrements the VR list accordingly, and then gives us the uh, dereference value from the right position at the VA list. So now at this point we have unwrapped our argument and we can use it. So in this case, average plus equals x. And when we are done using our list, we should use uh, VR and the name. But if we look on the definition, it actually doesn't do anything but just set the value to zero. So it doesn't matter. We we don't need that. We could just leave it out. And of course, one more thing: since this is supposed to be an average, we need to define this by the amount of elements we had in the list. Um, the average. Uh, right, yo. Um, yes. Good. So uh, let's quickly invoke this function. We can just can give it the same arguments and just want to keep the return value this time. And the way this is impl uh, implemented um, in case of 32 bit is like any normal call. You have you pushes you are pushing everything to the stack, then you are calling the function and then you are here um, just clearing the stack. If we switch to 64 bit and run it again, uh, we will see that the calling conventions remains this extended fast call with four arguments, and then the rest is here. So of course the obvious question is how can we step through the argument list easily? But before we take a look on this, let's quickly switch back to the previous case and go into our function before we do anything. Run. Okay. So inside the function, you see we kind of are directly starting with preparing our base point and uh, uh, reserving some place of the sta on the stack and saving some registers and then doing things. And the way, so here, what we basically do is we just get the address uh, from the base pointer plus um, see how much c will be probably something like twelve ish. X C X should be turned off. Yeah, twelve. Um and twelve four eight um twelve. So these are we want kind of the the last val the value this point ahead before we push those things on the stack. Um and then we to this value subtract another four. Okay, and at this point uh, we have save. So the um, ECX value will keep now the pointer um, and asterisk to our. It should have the pointer to our first argument. Um, zero. Well, it's kind of not quite right. One. Um, shifted by something let's see why um, uh, okay so here we have our thing and here we have our um, this will start where will this start so part of this is the loop and the other part is this so let's maybe um, make this a bit more um, easy to read so we know where each line starts in the code and where every other sta other line ends, right? So we see here um, 
this code is just this line and this code here now is this line so we are taking um, the value which we stored before here uh, we add 4 to it okay so this we forgot to be here plus 4 yeah then to refine uh, oops but it's not ECX uh, we need to go at least until here, until here. continue uh, EX yes oops. and it are it haven't done the 4 yet uh, so we need to do this as well. Sack. Um. <laughs> takes the well. If we put a pointer here, that will at least definitely work. Um, just a bit more convoluted. So, no, something is wrong. Uh, oh, I know why it's wrong. We should have told it how many arguments it has. I was, I got confused because. <laughs> I got I got not the values that I have expected, and the reason was we forgot to uh, pass the argument because I kind of wanted to average those together, and here um have the na number and I forgot that that threw me off for a second. So let's rerun the whole thing. Let's put the pointer here. We can simplify this again. Zack. Okay, so we have our run again. We have our AP which is stored in the AX register. And then if we take it asterisk AX um, from zero, we can just by iterating through the pointer here um, go through the entire list of values which we have um, specified. Uh, right, zero t uh, that that was um, we already had zero. So as you see, all the data are stored in the memory in a consecutive er uh, memory space and this way we can kind of uh, thread the whole argument list which we have um, passed here as a as individual arguments as one array of arguments and this array list is consecutive in memory as it's obvious since when we go here we see that we just put them one after the other after the other after the other and so on and now if we switch to the 64-bit uh, version then, um, as mentioned, there is some there is some catch because um, we only put this once in a consecutive memory space. So let's see how the function what the function will internally do. And we also remember from before that um, the call operator, uh, the call opcode, puts um, the current address on the on the stack. So if we would um, just push everything to the stack and then call directly after it, then uh, we wouldn't have space to put any additional data in a consecutive memory region. So let's uh, run, run this once more. And here, instead of our function, we see that the first thing the function does is it takes the stack pointer and it saves those uh, four registers onto the stack using um, a set of offsets. And the way this looks internally, once this function call is executed, is more something like this. Just need a bit more room. So, um, 0, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Then it has uh, four empty spaces. Oops, sorry, too much. And then it will get the return address. And this this way, once we enter the function, we have room here into which we can write the remaining four values and then again end up with a co array of arguments. And this uh, the necessity to leave this space on the stack th free and unused before a function call is part of the x64 calling convention on Windows. So whenever you're calling a function, you will always I'll first allocate some additional room and then um, leave it empty and unused. The function uh, can then use this, r this space, it is, it is called a scratch area, uh, to write down those arguments if it is a variable argument function or if it is just a normal function then it can use this memory area to do some, to store some temporary variables 
obviously in a debug build it will not do that in a debug build it will only use this area to store the f first four arguments um, always so um, there will not be no optimization but if you would have a release build then there there would be such a optimization that it might uh, just keep the values in registers and then just start computing with them and use this for uh, slots on the stack to uh, save some tempor temporary results. This is also the reason why uh, function calls mm, here are not using uh, the push operation but instead the move because it wants to save um, because otherwise if you would use pushes then you would then need to add some additional empty space anyway so <coughs> it is m more elegant and you need less instructions in total when you are using this move instructions um, instead and then of course since um, here we have um, the value in EX it turns them the general idea with how um, this 64-bit calling convention is implemented is that functions also try at the beginning to just allocate the entire stack space that they will need and then um, they just work with it while on 32-bit um, you might see more stack growing and shrinking within a function like with every function call it would uh, push things on the stack and then pop them back so to keep the size of the stack as small as possible but on 64-bit uh, um, the, the architects decided that it would be um, more efficient compute wise to just sacrifice a bit memory and then be able to have la one large uh, stack area which is uh, set up to be big enough that it will be able to accommodate every uh, function call um, yes so that much to this um, These functions are uh, quite useful because they allow you um, a very high degree of flexibility. So in principle, you don't need uh, every argument to be of the same type. You, you could have like with the printf function, which I mentioned earlier, uh, any argument can be of a different type. So um, the next thing we'll take a look on is, um, well, <laughs> different argument types. So obviously when you are using uh, int or uh, short or long or any other um, integer machine type uh, it will always use the same registers as we have seen already but uh, if you would want to use uh, floating point numbers then since those registers are not made for uh, floating point numbers uh, they will need uh, there will be a need to uh, use different registers in principle you could kind of copy of course values um, from one register to to, to it the other but that would add unnecessary additional operations so um, the way the typical calling conventions are defined is such that um, when encountering uh, floating point types the compiler will just pick uh, different registers so um, where are we? we don't want to be here let's remove that breakpoint and go to here right so as you see here instead of using so here again we just have two of them so instead of using um, ECX and EDX we are using XMM0 and XMM1 for the uh, values and we also should save the return value to something so uh, uh, and if we want we could also add more arguments just to see how this will look um, Actually, we could just copy those and then use um, find and replace to replace everything with double. So to find and replace in a file, you make Control H, and then you can specify uh, what you are searching for and what you want to replace it with. And then it will um, here allow you to click to next, next, next. So let's set the cursor again at the beginning. Then we can use this one to replace only one element. The other button to the right from this one will replace all the ins in the whole file so this would not be something you would usually want to um, let's specify it like this and let's run it again okay so as you see here the calling convention is somewhat um, 
somewhat similar so we are using uh, the first four um, values are stored in the registers and all the additional arguments are put on the stack again we have room that we could uh, copy them back if you would want to and in, in fact here and the function even though it is not using them since it's a debug build it will always put them f in memory so that we ha we can inspect them in a debugger no matter what the registers are holding right now. One difference uh, to the integer case is that the XMM0 register, which we can actually s view here as well, we just have to right click and select XMM registers, voila, here they are. That we have a few more different registers, this one we don't care, um, SSE is also sometimes uh, useful, they are just um, um they are just um much lo much longer they can store up to 128 bit and on some architectures you have AVX which is i think uh 250 and you can even have AVX um uh 512 which can store up to 512 bit in a in in one single register and as you see here already from the display the registers are segmented so um i they are used for operations which um just do the same operation I on the whole vector of of elements at the same time so for example when copying memory or adding vectors together or doing stuff like that uh, special instructions using those registers uh can speed up things uh, considerably but anyhow uh, what i want to say is that here we are reusing this um x uh, mm0 register for the return value while on with the integer use case we had one register for the first argument and another register for the ret return value and if i recall correctly with arm um it is uh, also such that the x0 register is used for the first argument and then it is reused for the return value in some special cases this this might be a bit problematic but usually it is not since you are usually not care for the values of the arguments after you have uh, passed them, plus the functions are allowed to so all the registers uh, which are used for the arguments are defined as volatile anyway so um, the function can change them and there is no guarantee which value will be in them once you return from your uh, function um, but as mentioned um, these other register types we will not be looking into we just care for the very basic so the integer and the floating point ones which we have seen here and the next interesting thing will of course be uh, how this works if we have uh, more complex types so we can uh, create a structure for example let's use a little less here um, just add a lot of integer variables 2, 3, 4 and 5 Oops, four. This should be about 20 characters in size. And as we have noticed uh, earlier when already working with structs, we can use them like variables, we can assign them directly and the compiler will use very efficient uh, repeated instructions to, uh, to copy the data around automatically. Uh, right, then we of course need a function that would use this, so uh, right. Let's let's keep this chronological. So int my phone struct, um, and then we'll just pass the struct as an argument. Um, and we return return zero. Oops. Uh, then we make another function which will return a, a structure we just take an integers argument we, and of course then we need structures So you can in fact return a whole structure which oops that's the wrong bracket which already asks the question how can this be if we 
are expected to use registers here, so let's see how this will work. So, uh, int uh, do we have a ret? We yeah, we don't have a ret yet. We just have my ret. So let's reuse the my ret, and then we pass uh, the structure to it. It's now complaining it does not have yet any arguments, and now voila. Uh, um, Right, I have one argument too much here. Okay, so as you see here, the way it works is we will let's maybe maybe the names. Uh, <coughs> so we will try to uh, store the address of uh, this structure in RCX. Um, but then we so so first of all we. Uh, Re 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 mm, reserve some memory on the stack, or rather, we are using a already reserved memory. We are picking a place on the stack which we have already reserved, which we know is yet empty to have the to have Rex point to it. Then we get the address of our struct one. Then here we are actually using the. So here we will want to copy everything from uh, Rex to RCX. So we, we store those values into those registers which we have earlier seen in one of the uh, uh, last lectures where we uh, copied structures so here it does the same thing and in ECX it saves the size of the structure and then it uses repeat move instructions to copy the content of our structure into a memory region at uh, Rux and then uh, when, it when, when we will be calling our function uh, it will have uh, put the address, so what was in RCX, it's now put in the first register, so in the on the first argument. So effectively, the first argument of the function, so, sorry, yeah, the first argument of the function with a structure will contain the address of the structure. And if the structure would be the second argument, then of course would be the second register. And if the structure would be like a fifth or sixth argument, then its address would be put on the stack. So the types which we are communicating through the stack to the function or through registers are always machine types and if we have a complex type like a structure what we do is we create in our own memory space a local copy and then we only communicate the address of this copy to the function so inside the function, when we go to it well inside the function we are not doing anything so we probably should do something with it so let's quickly um, say that we want just return the sum of the first two values in our uh, structure. Let's put a breakpoint here. Let's run it. So, what we do here, basically, we, we, we got the address in the first register, we saved it, and then when we start to here to do our operation, we will again uh, retrieve, retrieve the address of our block. Um, then we will store the data uh, in oh, from one of them in ERX then we will again retrieve the address so this is made in an inefficient way incremented by 4 because here like we, t we took the var1 to access var2 we need to add this plus 4 and then we add it and then in EAX we have our return value our computed sum and then uh, we just restore the stack and then return this value. Um, so let's uh, quickly see how this would look if we would have um, one, two, three, four. So a few more in, uh, arguments here. Let's copy them from there. So that we don't need to type. Um, suck. So here, as you see. Uh, we are again having just a standard copy operation to make a duplicate of our structure and then here uh, we just store its address as already mentioned on the stack at the position where the uh, fifth argument would have been stored um, and then of course inside the function we will then um, access the base pointer with the right offset uh, to get the value uh, which represents the uh, the address of our structure and then we can either take one value directly from it and then here we need to add the offset to access the var2 variable ok 
Okay, and now let's try the other thing. Uh, let's quickly undo this since we don't need that. Now let's see how this how this this mecha how the mechanism works if we want to return a structure from a function. Because somehow this must work as well, obviously. So uh, and we should give it something to do. Well, it is already something to do. But we could like even make it more complicated. The first value will be will be arc, and the other ones will be filled in. So, yep. Let's run this. Okay, so uh, well we ended up in the wrong breakpoint, so let's quickly run it again. Right, so we are here in our call. We um, we we'll want to have the first argument somewhere, so we'll st store it um, in uh, RCX, and then um, we execute the call. And then after the call, so let's go, go through it step by step. So, uh, as you see, we have only uh, cared about passing here the uh, one uh, argument. We didn't uh, care at this point about the return value. Um, okay, so let's see how this will work. So we we have we enter here our function. Here we will have just the initialization of the structure. Step and here in the return, what we do is we take uh, the we, we write a offset to the rex register, so we take the base pointer plus 70, so this will be uh, a position which is slightly before uh, what we had when we entered the function, um, and then to this position. Uh, we store ax um, usually it's destination and then it's what? So we store an address to memory which we have not allocated ourselves which has been allocated for us uh, somewhere here before the return address in the rex register and then if we uh, then we of course we store the um stack and then if we return the the rex register will um uh point all right wait. uh will point to the um address where our data are stored so let's quickly run it again so we store the e d x so the first argument in e d x and if we look before uh, we stored uh, uh, we were here no here yes we stored the first argument in ECX so since we have a um, structure as a return type all the arguments are shifted by one so if we would have many arguments we would only use those uh, three registers and then already started using the stack and the first uh, argument here we use to give it a memory address where we want the resulting structure to be stored to. So um, once we enter the function, the function will uh, from the first argument. This is here. Um, from the first argument, be able to to read the memory address where the resulting structure after the return operation should end up uh, being being stored at and then it will kind of return to us the same value again so here we have not yet overwritten um, uh, RCX and let's enable hex display but if we return from the function we would expect that RAX should be the same value and as you see it is the same value and then further down we can use the uh, well, we can either use rex or we can use. Um, uh, I think we'll be using rex. Yes. So first of all, we we select an another RCX with another offset. So the first one 
here was like a scratch area which we uh, will not be uh, using ourselves for our own data which the function can overwrite and the other RCX is actually where in memory we expect our struct to, to live so if we show the names uh, well, it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't, but in this case it did not well it did not because it's kind of inefficient so I I if you look at it, it has this operation here twice, so first of all it uses two um, scratch areas, one that it gives to the function to write the result to then it has an own scratch area into which it copies the result from which it got from the function in the first scratch area and then only as the third step it copies the result from the second scratch area to the actual memory region where struct2 should live so this is a bit very inefficient um, and this is also why uh, returning structures is not uh, always a good idea so of course if we compile as a release build that should be optimized uh, much better so that will probably give it the address where a struct2 will live directly to RCX and then it will just uh, not need to do all these operations but in the debug build it kind of does the things all the things step by step so uh, the obvious um, next uh, <laughs> question would be what would be the more elegant more efficient way of uh, passing a structure and we can start with this function and we just pass the structure well one thing that is obvious you can do is you just can pass a pointer to a structure but um, the more convenient thing is you can just pass a structure as reference which internally is the very same thing so we can um, name them maybe 1 and 2 um, but in the code it looks different so one, one is a pointer, one is a reference with the pointer we need to use the error operator while with the reference we did not and now here um, when calling the one version which is the reference we can just do it as is while when calling the second version we need to obtain the address but as you will see internally those two functions should be kind of identical and then as you see here in both cases we just get the, re the address and put the address into the first register and then we call the function when we, that, so let's do that, let's enter the function and inside the function then we just do some uh, point arithmetics and again both functions look pretty much identical even though they look here in code quite differently <coughs> we have already taken a look on this um, aspect of this reference sort of variables uh, when uh, we looked on pointers in the last lecture but here we really um, can nicely see that um, a pointer and the reference under the hood is the exact same thing the only difference is how we ad address it in the code and in this case we have seen that in this that at no point we need to make a copy of our structure so this is much more efficient but of course it is in a way dangerous because we can just modify uh, any value and this modification will be then reflected in the original structure we have passed to our function so um, the responsible thing to do would be to define those variables as const because then we should not be able to change them as you see here or there Oops. if we try to assign something to them the compiler tells us that we are not allowed to do because it is type const and this is generally the approach which you should always pick when passing structures uh, especially large structures to your various uh, functions you should just pass them by pointer or by reference and not by uh, value because as I said the by value you will need to copy the whole value um, and of course this what we have seen here opens us a, another opportunity how to use a structure um, we can if we want to return values we could just have a void function let's call it arc3 uh, no, let's call it uh, ah, doesn't matter. Let's, let's stick with arc3 we will just then use um, a reference and w oops, that's not the right character and what we basically do here is 
in a way um, we kind of do the same thing that the compiler did. We are taking our structure, we are putting it at the first as the first argument. I mean, we we have the freedom to also put it as the last argument or wherever we want. But here, let's just keep it at the, as the first argument, and then we will have only one uh, copy operation here where we assign the structure. And of course, we could optimize th this and uh, try to assign the structure directly. So. Uh, uh, this way there are quite a few opportunities to optimize um, uh, our code. So this is equivalent with that, just that the way it works is it is more efficient. And what we actually could try doing, <laughs> if we are particularly um, adventurous, we could uh, try to um, having this function to save on a few operations. So let's um, define a function. Let's first copy its uh, prototype. Zack. Uh, we want to make a function pointer. My func struct pointer. Um, semicolon. Okay, so this is our original function. Um, this one will be just our function. Actually, uh, we should not reuse the same. So the compiler can tell them apart because they have different types. Oh, this is another thing about um, uh, C++, that if you have a C++ file and you have two functions with the same name, as long as they are at least different in which types the arguments have, the compiler will be able to te tell them apart and always pick the right one. With C, it doesn't work this way. Um, but for now, let's give this one like a zero in the name so that we are, so that we don't have reused function names. Here we also get the zero and here as well. Then let's uh, also have a function pointer to our function number three, which is a different prototype, uh, not three, it's here, which is void. I function PTR uh, 0 and 3. Okay. And now what we could do is if we want to uh, invoke function 1, so here we don't assign anything, we just make the pointer. Um, without this many copy operations, we could, in principle, typecast our function with a return value on our function which uh, uses the first argument as a return and then we can call that uh, we need to pass to it the struct too ok, so let's see, breakpoint run and as you see, the call is very quick. We don't copy anything around. The return value is also very quick. We don't copy anything around. And if we enter the function, uh, we are entering actually our function here. So we expect, uh, once we are here, that the arc 1 is 1. So we should have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then here we will be directly writing to the structure which we have already defined. So at this point when we exit the function our structure too should already contain the values which we have written to it. So obviously this is not something that would be recommended to use in, in production code. If you write your own code you should just um, go with the simple approach and use uh, which one was it? This one? Where you are just directly uh, passing the function the structure um, by reference or as a pointer and that's it. Um, but of course, if you would have some third-party code which you want to call in a particularly efficient way, um, you could uh, do something like this. And then um, you save on some copy operations. And as also as mentioned, those copy operations in a release build would most likely be optimized away, s away anyways, so that there is not really the necessity to do such uh, trickery uh, yourself. I just want to demonstrate that um, when using C uh, or C++, you have have a very 
high degree of flexibility so you can really do um, many things you can do whatever you want to a certain extent and the compiler will not prevent you from doing very adventurous things it's the, it is then your responsibility to ensure that um, what you are doing will work out correctly it will not result in some memory corruption or something like that um, okay and yet another thing to mention so as I already said if you have functions with the same name but different arguments the compiler can uh, smartly enough tell them apart what you can also do in C but not in C++ you can specify default arguments so for example here in our arc, uh, in our uh, arc3 function we could just write uh, arc0 is equal 0 or is equal 1 to 4 or whatever we want and then when we are calling this function we don't need to specify the additional argument the compiler will see aha there is a value specified so let's see how that would look and in this case 7b is like a uh, hex it doesn't it's uh, basically the one to free value from before we just need to turn off hex Oops. so the compiler if you specify such default arguments will still only create one instance of the function but it will fill in the the arguments which you have left out for you here in the when creating the function call so this is quite useful as well since um, you might have a function where in 90% of the cases you don't need any extra arguments but then in some cases you want to tell the function to behave slightly differently and then you could create such default arguments and um, <coughs> it will uh, save you on typing and you can have as many default arguments as you want there is uh, just one rule that needs to be uh, adhered to is that all optional arguments must be uh, consecutive and must be at the end of the argument list so you cannot have a non you don't have can so you cannot have like a int uh, uh, three at the very end which is not which does not have a value specified so this uh, the compiler should um, complain about uh, if you would try to compile it the simple reason is that the compiler then would not know which function to which value to to fill in and you can also not like leave it like this so there in some other languages like I think Visual Basic if I recall correctly you can have uh, default arguments anywhere and then just to maintain the order of arguments you can just like make a comma comma or another comma and then the compiler would fill this in but C++ has like a simplified version of it where you can have your optional arguments only at the end and that's that so um, I think this is uh, a quite verbose overview of um, all the different functions um, Are there any questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. Um, so y you can always c um, cast something that is not const onto something that is const. So in this case, when we use this function, our structure itself is not const, but and we can assign it to a const reference, and inside the function here, it will be const. So you will not be able to try to assign things to it. Of course, you could cast it on, on a non-const version and then change it anyways, but the idea is you should not do it if the if the function expects you not to change the f the the function then you should just uh, the argument then you should just um keep to it and not change it any more questions okay um if there are no more questions on these then uh let's uh, try doing a few more maybe examples uh, right so for example uh, this default arguments uh, where were those were these 
would be useful. Um, let's say you make a function that um, calculates uh, what can we calculate? Let's make a function that, that implements division. So um, int my div int uh, one and arc two. Oops, int arc one and arc two. So at this point, is obviously quite a simple function. It just re returns uh, arc one divided by arc two. And it just does substitute with cost two. So we should not reuse the same name. But you might, for example, have a scenario where you would also want to um, know the modular of the operation. So let me first improve that. Uh, res. Um, int res is equal to this. So let's say you would want to have a second return value from your function, but only in special cases. Now, obviously, with this case, it's a trivial. But if you would have, for example, a custom number that can be bigger than a uh, number that the computer can represent, so let's say something that's 128 bit or so, as used in cryptography, then you would need to um, break down any mathematical operation on this one number into multiple smaller operations on numbers that the computer can handle. And in this case, um, your division might be a, qu a quite elaborate uh, uh, process and then you might uh, automatically, as part of your implementation of this division, get the the residue of the division internally, and then you would just always discard it. But and then, of course, if you would want to have the division and the um, so the the division result, the integer division result plus the remainder remainder, then you would kind of need to do the things, all the operations twice, which would be highly inefficient. So you would implement, for example, your function such that you add an additional argument, which can then um, uh, p mod c plus null, which then can take the value um, that you want, that you otherwise would, would discard. So in this case, of course, um, it's quite trivial. So first of all, we check whether the argument has been passed. So if this is a pointer and it is null, then it's not valid. So we check if it's not null. And if it is not null, we can dereference it and then assign to it the result of the module operation. Um, and of course, the usual expectation would be that here you would have uh, some complex computation and then you would already, already have the value for pmod in a variable somewhere, you would just need to assign it and you would just have one simple check to, to see if there is if the user that called the function wants this or not. And then when using it you would have uh, int div res is equal to this and int, int div mod comma and then you have uh, let's say uh, var1 how they call it I call them my var so let's stick to it my var1 comma my var2 comma reference the uh, mod and such a function let's make this uh, non-capital you can only use with a uh, so this method you can only use with a pointer not with a reference because the reference forces you to provide the value uh, that then can be this can be returned to so if you would um, have your mod as a uh, reference like this like here then you would always need to fill it in and then you when calling the my div function you would always need to uh, to give it um, some 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 dummy variable to write to. But if you are like um, we did it using a pointer then you can just not do anything keep it like this and voila you will automatically get um, you, do, you don't need to add this dummy variable. It would automatically know that this variable has not been provided. It will fill in the, z the null value and the null value will tell the function uh, during execution time that in this case it should not uh, Save the remainder of the remainder of the operation anywhere. So uh, this is one use case where such a function is um, useful. And in fact, there are quite uh, this is a quite common scenario where you have a function that does something and it has one return value, and you might want additional return values or additional parameters, uh, which might be uh, complex. They might be, as mentioned already, uh, entire structures, and then you would just if you are not using them, just have nulls, and if you are using them, provide the right va variables. So, 
C is in this way a very uh, flexible language which is um, quite good because in other ways it's not flexible so it helps you to compensate for that and I think one last thing we should uh, maybe take a look at will be to do some manipulation of uh, of the stack so um, let's see what we can do um, first of all we could uh, try to read the return address that um, the fun a function would return to so let's uh, again um, right. v red is equals um, how do we call that uh, what asterisk my func x uh, x and then just um, assign the return value and in the function we we now would want to find out um, the return address where we would where the function would return if it would return so one way of doing it is uh, to just use so-called uh, compiler intrinsics so we need an include for that first uh, hash include uh, inter in each and then we can uh, void asterisk red um, red pointer is equals underscore address of return instruction no address of return address uh, well actually the, we can we have two functions so the address of return address will give us um, the address in memory where the return address is stored while the address of return instruction will give us the value to which we will re re want to return to so we will take the address of return address because this is more fun um, good then um, we can just uh, de so here we can then just dereference it so um, uh, red pattern then With our red, this will be a point. So it's a point. So our red pointer is a pointer on a pointer, and then we just want to dereference it once, and then we can return it. Oops. Okay, uh, when we run it, you okay, we have a breakpoint too much. We see that this contains an address of our function, and then we can. Uh, step out of it and then here actually if we look here it will be the one five nine two one five sorry two say uh, two yeah this one this address so as you see you, you can from within a function retrieve the address um, to which once the function returns it will return to and if you see here how this is implemented even though this looks like a function call we are actually not calling anything that's why it, it is called a compiler intrinsic so it there there is a su subset of uh, pseudo functions which within the uh, programming uh, code you are using like a function but when they are actually then compiled then the compiler will replace them with some operation that is executed in place wherever you are so in this case we are just uh, getting the address from so we know here that we added to the stack pointer 50 hex and we know that the stack pointer was pointing to the first empty slot after the return address so if we add to it 50 plus 8 then it will point to the actual uh, return to the, to the actual memory location which keep which contains the return address and then um, we will get this value in our regs register which we then can dereference and this is quite a powerful um, capability because we can use it to do quite um, interesting hacky thingies so let's try doing one of them uh, so first of all we will copy our function no. uh, let's start like this, let's start int my function zero so we start with a function then for and 
Oops. So we have a function, we uh, allocate some text space in the function with some values, then int my my return. We'll call another function. See my function one. Oops. Uh, which does not exist, hence it complains, and then we just add one uh, my add one. Okay, so as far so trivial, nothing, nothing to see. Let's move along. We have our function one, which will um, use this method to get uh, the return address, and we will uh, define a global variable for. Uh, oops. Original return address. So here we will save this uh, return address. <coughs> so we need to uh, do some casting um, in 64 asterisk. Okay, so here now we have stored the original return value from where the function came function 1 and then what we can do is we can overwrite it with something else that might crash <laughs> um, n64 uh, right is equals actually haven't tested this code on this new hardware because there, there's actually a feature in modern hardware which prevents this particular uh, trick which I want to try here and then turn zero, oops. Uh, 0 and our function 2 will have a um, right so it will again take the return pointer um and then change it to um the original return pointer uh, and to return uh, return one. I'm actually interested whether this will work or whether it will crash because um, the manipulation which we are doing here is something that uh, modern CPUs with the shadow stack uh, protection feature will actually uh, try to prevent in hardware and try an exception if someone tries to modify return addresses. Uh, although running it uh, under debug might uh, disable that uh, protection. We will see. I think there is a flag that I need to switch to enable this protection. So we might have. Um, it should probably work. Uh, let me suck. Let's wait. Function zero. My integer will be fine. I ah, yes, it's the wrong type. Let's quickly check if this functionality is enabled. Uh, was it here? I think it was with the link. Uh, um, all options. Okay, it's not enabled, so the code should ru run just fine. So first of all, we will uh, disable the manipulation here, Oops. and what we expect what we expect this to do is just uh, very simple. It will just it should just return zero because it's what the function does. So um, we put the breakpoint here. We run the code. And we got zero. Okay, let's re-enable our hack, and then run the code, and should get one, and it worked. And now, if we would have enabled um, this uh, stack protection feature, and it should crash, assuming the the computer hardware supports it. And voila, <laughs> we managed to. Uh, crash the application. So uh, let's quickly disable 
this um, stack protection again. You can just either select no or select to use the default which is also no. And now we can uh, step through the function to see what is exactly happening inside it. So, uh, obviously we have our call, so maybe we should also uh, open the stack view. Um, uh, uh, um, it grows downwards, so that should be fine where we are. So we have the call, we have the point at the right position, we make a step inside. Um okay, so we are inside our function and we are doing something which we don't really care for. <coughs> Why don't we see the let's quickly restart it again. Um uh, again um L S yeah. So we we s the middle of so the end of the stack is our pointer here, so we go inside, well, it sh I, sh I, sh I, sh I should see the change here, why doesn't that work, um, and to have this uh, to be as illustrative as possible, um, LSP, uh, hex of course, this address, You could, we could write it down to s so that we can by hand compare, but the expectation would be that the compare thing should compare for us, but it doesn't. Um, <laughs> ah, no way. Uh, no, I don't know why. Um, As we have seen, the call changes always the stack point, and the RSP should, when we do the call, change it. Where did it change? Okay, let's just write it down. <laughs> um, RSP. Save a few lines around our current stack location. Uh, editor. Okay. Now when we do call, um, right. It was um, which one was it here? Okay. The call. Okay. So our SP should be changed by um, eight. It is. Now we compare if something changed. Ah. Uh, uh, I thought I see that change. Um, <laughs> and get some function. So register RBP. Ah, it was the uh, RSP. Did I type RBP before? RSP. No, it should be the right one. Um, clear. So RSP. Um, it's this address, and currently at this address there should be a point ten. Uh, nothing and after we execute the call the this one should what did I break here? Um <laughs> you have seen that already working before today. Uh why? So we have our call function so we have our registers. If we just look watch the registers we see that the RSP increased by one and the instruction point increased as it should. And now the value this points to should be the return address and it is. So why don't we see this in the memory area before? Ok. 
Okay, so again, RSP, and this will grow downwards. So RSP minus eight will be this one, and then we want to see this one. Ah, it is already. Uh, it already has the right value. That's why we don't see a change. Um, or it has a very similar value at least. Um, watch ten, ten. Okay, yeah. Uh, since we are doing other things, we kind of it only changes one character somewhere. And then we that's why we did notice it. So uh, it works as expected. We just should maybe uh let's just uh, comment out everything before that so that we don't have uh values on the stack which uh look too familiar. That is just distracting. Okay, so now we should have a clean stack. Um without things that will confuse us too much. Okay, so we do our call. Okay, it we we see that it wrote the address here. It doesn't show it in red. I'm not sure why this fails, but we see that before that it was all uh, yeah FFFs, and now we now we have the address, the return address here. So this a uh, fail on Visual Studio side. It should have uh, shown us this change after the single step operation. So here then we uh, change some other things around on the stack. Oh, and I stepped too, too far. I mean, to rerun it. Um, I will comment this out because this is not really needed for this demo. <sighs> right here. So we are again here. Then we need to go again to RS, um, RSP. So the entire stack space for the current function, which we haven't used yet, is uh, filled here with these FFFs. Now again, if we step into here, it replaced them with the return address. Then uh, we can single step into the next function. Fortunately, we don't see the change here. This is really annoying. Um, I think it put the return value here. Okay, so. We copy our return value, and now what we'll do here is we'll overwrite it in this step. Okay, this is somehow this should show changes in red, but it's not doing this. I don't know why it is not tracing it anymore. Um, that makes the demonstration particularly difficult. Um, <laughs> Auto. Okay, let's try it again. Maybe I clicked on something that I wasn't supposed to. Again, RSP, RSP. Uh, the same address now. Step in. No, it's this will not help. Um. I just restart Visual Studio. I have no idea why it w before we we saw it. It was showing the whenever something changed, it marked it in red just as it should, and now it somehow it fails at that. Let's see if now it will do um, RSP. Is it supposed to do suck single step? That still didn't work. Um, Disable something data accessible. No. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. well, it doesn't work. Um, so let's try to be very careful about what we change. Um, so we go here step by step. So uh, we remember that here we have our first return address. And then here we have some unused stack space, so here we step through it, we have already overwritten it, and some changes it shows, it, sh it seems only to not show them during calls. So we do the call, 
and it is really not convenient without seeing anything. Um, I'm thinking about how to demonstrate it without this highlighting because this is annoying. Um, I can just open another memory window, maybe the other one will be working. Um, okay, memory 2, RSP. Oops, one R too much. Let's see if this one works better. No, it doesn't. Um, I have no idea wha what I broke in the configuration of the Visual Studio that it doesn't show the changes. Um, then we need a workaround for that. Um, let's use a third party tool. Okay, so this is a text comparison tool. So we will restart the whole thing once more. We don't need the second view, RSP. RSP. Copy a large memory block around where our stack is. Ah, this is annoying. Um, okay, so now we execute the first operation. Zack, then copy everything. Okay, so as you see here, we have overwritten eight characters with the return address. Now let's um, step through the function. We have here another call, so there will be some more changes. Okay. Now we make this our reference. We jump into the function. Oh, now it worked. Now it showed it here in red. Decided to work magic. Automatically decided to work. <laughs> but here we c we can now tra track the same changes. Okay. So now we make another step. Well, it started working. We don't need the workaround. Okay. Uh, this one didn't do anything. This one loaded a register. This one here. Um, gave us the return address and then this point when we do this operation it has overwritten the return address on the stack with the return address of function number uh, function two um, so now when uh, red will be executed so here we have our stack our uh, the stack is already messed up we should uh, rerun it we want to uh, run until uh, function one until here. Okay, so for now we have a proper stack trace RSP. Let's copy this again. It's apparently it's not reliable. Um, and now what we do in this operation in this line. We overwrite the overwrite the return address, and the stack here starts to be messed up because the compiler, um, so the debugger cannot uh, properly find out what is going on, despite the fact that we have only overwritten here. So we overwritten, of course, more than eight, but since the values are close to each other, only two characters really have been changed. And now, when the when we here try to return, so when we do this return, we would expect to return to uh, the main function, so to the address that initially, uh, so basically this address we have saved here, but instead of returning there, we are, we are jumping to function 2, because the address of function 2 has been saved as the return address uh, for uh, the invocation of function 1. And then still here the stack trace is kind of messed up, but now in function one, what we will do is we will uh, we st so now if we would jump out of function one, we expect to go back to function two, but we don't want to go back to function. Uh, sorry, I messed it up. 
now in function 2 when we return from function 2 we would expect to return out to function 1 so if we go f for here and make the step and then take read the value of this thing it tells uh like two words okay doesn't want to Mm. Well, return pointer. We should should point us somewhere within the function. So um, it may be because we messed up. The stack is now kind of not happy about this. But if we go to function one, we we see that the address of function one, uh, address of function two. Let's see. So we need to dereference. So function one, so function one where we would want to return to has this address and our return pointer which we dereference uh, there's something wrong about that so zero, this oh, was it already a pointer? No. Uh, something's not right with this um, View here. Um, <laughs> let's just make. Uh, where, where are we? I think we already started overwriting it. So let's again uh, put a point, uh, a breakpoint here before we change anything. And the system will be in a consistent state. Right. That is not, it looks much better. So our uh, return pointer and the function. That is that still doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but it should work. So pointer, right? A pointer on a pointer. This points to eight. Uh, well, it, the code works apparently when because we when we run it, it does what it should do. But for some reason, um, the compiler. The ID here is not helpful with the debugging of that thing, so let's try it again. Oops, that was the wrong one. Here. Zack, zack. So uh, again, we are here. We have our pointer, which should be, uh, which points to our stack, somewhere in the stack. So uh, this one is here, and the RSP is uh, quite close to it, just um, slightly somewhere else. And then, in principle, the return value, as mentioned already, if we dereference it, it should give us the address of of function one. But for some reason, it ah, it should give us a, a function one, but inside function one, that is odd that this does not work. Um, but anyhow. When we overwrite it with the right return address, which we want to to have, and then when we return, then it jumps directly back to main. I'm just thinking why it didn't. So if we of course uh, just comment this out and let it put the breakpoint here and let it run, then we should um, just return out in function number one. So we just step th through this, zack zack. Nope. Um. <laughs> ah, no, that 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 is that is of course. Um, that makes sense. Um, that makes sense. Uh, this will not work this way. So the function does what it is supposed to do, but the return value. The return value gets messed up. Let's keep some things on the stack to that have a defi defined value. Um, okay, oh, that was one too much. We wanted to go here. Zack. Okay. Um, no F. Uh, so the the thing is that when we here uh, do this um, return and uh, then jump to function two, 
then we of course d don't put the right value on the on the stack and what happens here is that we just pick some address um, to to put our original return address to but if if we exit this function sorry if when we exit this function while we will end up in main uh, we will have still corrupted the memory of main I think or it did work Ah, oh, right, that's it. Uh, <laughs> we should write the flowchart how this should work. So we start with function zero, which goes in here, and when we then do the manipulation, the original return address should be then again to function zero. And in function zero, we should then corrupt some memory because we will be missing. Um, one position on the stack and having two return invocations so I'm not sure how we can easily demonstrate it so this far worked and if this run the program it didn't crash um but it should uh Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we are running a bit out of time. The, the demo here <laughs> gets a bit complicated. Um, I'm thinking how we can make this more illustrative. Uh, well, okay. First of all, we can again disable here the um, the hack. Then we will just write um, in our function zero. So uh, print f. We we'll just add some uh, debug text that we have. Uh, call function one. Um, exit exit function zero, and then we we'll just in function one. Okay, so exit and and if we do this trick, then we want to go to function two. Again, uh, right here we will say we don't see anything. We will just say enter function two, exit function two. If we run it, we should see um, how this played out. So we see we enter function zero, we call function one. Uh, I think I miss, I forgot to update something. Yes, right, function one should. Oops. Function one, tag. Okay. Okay. So, enter function zero, call function one, enter function one, exit function one, and when we exit function one, we would expect to return uh, to function zero, but instead we, and I also have a typo here, exit. Um, but instead we exit to function two. And and then, um, when we exit function two, we would expect to go back to function one, but we go back directly to function zero. So in principle, memory-wise, we should not corrupt anything. I'm just w uh, puzzled by the fact that we don't get a a nice um, <laughs> that we don't get a nice. Um, value when we are here that this one shows the wrong value so let's see uh, enter function one um, comma add to hot cent x uh, hot cent um, just version text mm, zero x eight x comma pointer We just add here that we will write um, the return addresses down. Function one, function two. And before we enter, so then we will see uh, how this looks. Sack. Uh, from the breakpoint. Uh, 
Um, this is cutting. Uh, uh, this is not. Um, this is support percent p. It is uh, truncating numbers to 32 bit. Uh, yeah, it supports percent p. Uh, percent p is a placeholder for. Uh, just using a pointer as a address, so this will be fine. And right, so we, we always get a value to return value. So if I put a breakpoint here, we should see um, not quite right. We need to dereference it first. Uh, that should be correct. Because it's the address of the return, right? And we want to actually know the return uh, target. So, yeah, that is working. Um, I'm not sure why if I try to um, get this, it does not tell me the. It tell tell it tells me the address, but. Before, when we did those things, it always told me also here the um, where that would be in memory. Um, especially avoid stretch them, and that works. Interesting. I mean, we tried to avoid stretch uh, and it just gave us an invalid value. I have no idea why it now change to work uh, properly but now it works properly so in function here in function 2 we can continue our demo we see that the return address should be a function 1 so it would want to jump back to function 1 but since we have overwritten it it will then once we return jump back uh, directly to function uh, 0 So, as we see here, the control flow, uh, if, we can, if we play this completely, is um, interrupted. It is not. It does not follow the same path it took to enter function 2. And um, since we are running out of time, I think this is a good point to, to stop. Um, this uh, <laughs> demonstration did not run all the way as planned. But um, in the end, it works just fine, just for some reason. No, it doesn't. Um, why wouldn't that? Why would this only work conditionally? Um, in the end, it, it works fine. For some reason, the Visual Studio here is a bit not doing what it should be doing. Because even if we don't have the. So if we have the print Fs, which uh, also print the values to the console, everything works fine. And if we don't have them for some reason we cannot get the right values in the imminent view here but the code still executes as it should it takes the r the right detours and um, it's modifying the execution so um, we will stop at that I will um, upload I will upload the code with the printfs to the Moodle uh, there will be no homework today yet uh, next uh, in the next lecture we will um, do something for wi from which we will be able to uh, derive some nice homework. So um, that that's at least the plan. Are there any questions? Okay. Yes. Um. We have not discussed it yet, so if you, if you want, we can discuss it during the next lecture. Um, and as mentioned, as long as it's not has been discussed, then people can submit late solutions. So um, maybe not everyone wants it to be discussed just yet. I haven't looked if everyone uh, finished it. Um, yeah. Yes. Mhm. Mm
Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's not what was intended, but if it gives you the right result, then... Uh, well, it's not within the spirit of the exercise, but it's within the rules, let's say it like this. So it is okay. Any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then we will uh, stop uh, at this point. Um, I will add quite a few more comments to the thing here and upload it to Moodle. Um, so that I might rewrite it a bit because now we were uh, jumping a bit around within the whole subject. So I may maybe rewrite it to be a bit more structured. And if you come up with... So it I would advise to read through the comments to the upload that uh, C file and if you have any questions you can ask them during the next lecture. So have a nice um, Friday or maybe already a nice weekend and we will see each other next week. Bye bye!